For me today, we have one of the finest pairs of Colt 1861 Navy percussion revolvers in existence. On top of that, this is also one of the most famous pairs in existence. This pair was presented to a Union officer during the Civil War, and it's factory engraved, factory silver and gold plated, and they have a pair of carved antique ivory grips. So Colt 1861 Navy percussion revolvers are already one of the rarer Colt models and one of the more desirable. There's only around 38,000 of these revolvers made compared to over 200,000 of the Model 1860 Army revolvers which are made in the same time frame. If you take a look at the 61 Navies, even if you ignore the beautiful factory work, which we're gonna discuss in a second, the 61 Navy is a very attractive design. It's got the sleeker loading lever and round barrel design like the 1860 Army, but because it's still 36 caliber, you can see that the cylinder doesn't have to be stepped down, so again, it's a little sleeker design. And on this pair, you can see what absolutely sets it apart is the beautiful factory engraving and the gold and silver plating on the revolvers. So we go ahead and pick up the front revolver so we can take a look at it. Both revolvers have basically matching engraving patterns. These revolvers have very you know, Germanic style scroll engraving. Most of the engravers working for Colt in this time period were trained in Germany and then came over in the 1850s. Hermann Bodenstein would have been the primary engraving contractor when this revolver was engraved. But based on the specific details of the engraving, if you look at Herbert Hughes's book on Colt engravers of the 19th century, I believe this revolver was probably engraved by George Sturzing. And if you take a look, the scroll work is beautifully executed and it's very flowing. You can see it's got floral accents among the designs and it's got beaded backgrounds and very classic design of the engraving overall. And then on top of that, you got the fact that the revolver is silver plated and then it's got gold on some of the smaller components. And then one of the things I really enjoy about this pair is the carved ivory grips. You can see it's got raised relief, American Eagle and shield designs here on the left side of both grips. So on top of the you know, beautiful nature of the revolvers themselves, you also got this special deluxe presentation case and the accessories. So you can see it's a closely more French fitted style case. And then inside, the case is closely fitted to the accessories as well, which also includes this beautiful silver plated Colt powder flask. And then we've got the other usual accoutrements like a cap tin, a bullet mold, combination tool, etc. So in addition to what's inside the case, you've also got a presentation inscription on the scutcheon on the case lid here at the back. The inscription reads, presented to George A. Williams, Captain, 1st U.S. Infantry, as a token of respect from B.W. Warner, Memphis, Tennessee, May 1864. Captain Williams was a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point in 1852 and had a military career prior to the Civil War. Then during the Civil War, he was primarily stationed in the Western Theater and participated in several of the key victories along the Mississippi River in the early part of the war. Williams was severely wounded at the expedition by Yazoo Pass during the Vicksburg campaign, and this largely relegated him to staff roles for the remainder of the Civil War. While Williams' actions in the early part of the Civil War on the battlefield can be considered exemplary, his actions as a staff officer in the latter part of the war made him notorious. As a provost marshal in Memphis, Tennessee, he was part of a notorious criminal ring in which they were extorting thousands and thousands of dollars out of the local populace by arresting people, placing them into horrendous conditions in prison camps that Williams was in charge of, and then collecting ransoms. On top of that, they were also collecting money through cotton smuggling, which was very common in the period. Unlike Williams, B.W. Warner's identity is not as clear, but what we do know is a man named B.W. Warner was among the men held in prison underneath Williams' orders. In addition to the B.W. Warner that we find in the prisoners list, I've also located period records that show there was a Dr. B.W. Warner active in Memphis in the time period, and that's significant. Dr. B.W. Warner was an agent for the U.S. Sanitary Commission in Memphis. Another pair of beautiful Colt 1861 navies, somewhat similar to this pair, were presented by Samuel Colt's wife, Elizabeth Jarvis Colt, to the U.S. Sanitary Commission as well. So that provides a potential tie of to how a Southern doctor got a hold of a beautiful pair of Colt 61 navies to present them to a Union officer. They would have really high-end goods like these revolvers 
as part of the fairs and part of the events to raise funds, and the Sanitary Commission was basically raising funds to help care for wounded and sick soldiers. So the exact circumstances of how Williams got this pair from Warner aren't known. As I've mentioned before, we know there was a man by the same name that was held in prison, and we know Williams was extorting the local populace. So possibly, Warner presented this pair to Williams as part of his like ransom to get himself out of prison, or possibly for Williams' efforts that got Warner out of prison, maybe he saw that these revolvers were presented to Williams as well. Then the other possibility, of course, remains that Williams just simply got these through the sanitary fair, and Warner was the agent for the sanitary fair based in Memphis. Towards the end of the Civil War, Williams was directly involved in the worst maritime disaster in American waters in all of history, the Sultana disaster in April 1865. Basically, Williams was tasked with helping get Union prisoners that had been exchanged out of the Andersonville prison and other prisons in the South upriver from Vicksburg. To do so, they were using civilian steamboats and largely overcrowding them to line the pockets both of the steamboat captains and I have to imagine, given his past behavior, Williams and his fellow officers as well. The Sultana was only designed to have a carrying capacity of 376 passengers. By the time it left Vicksburg upstream, it had possibly more than 2,300 men on board. In addition to the overcrowding, the steamboat also had a leak in one of its four boilers that was discovered before it left Vicksburg. A local mechanic was tasked with fixing it, strongly urged the captain to remain longer so that they could get a proper repair. Instead, they just did a cheap patch over the leak, something that the mechanic had specifically recommended not doing. But the captain was worried he was going to lose his fee if he waited too long to get this repaired. So instead, he just had it quickly repaired and promised the mechanic that he'd have it fixed properly once they got back upstream. So Williams had delegated the responsibility for arranging this situation to another captain underneath his command, Captain Frederick Speed, because Williams was outside of Vicksburg for a period. But Williams actually returned in time to directly participate in the boarding of these men onto the Sultana. He was the one who actually checked them off of a list as they were boarding the boat. Um, did not do a very thorough job of that, leaving us to not quite know exactly how many people were on board. So upwards of 2,300 people were crammed on board a steamboat designed to carry around 376 people. For comparison, the significantly larger Titanic, you know, the biggest vessel of its era, had around the same number of passengers aboard it. On top of this overcrowding situation, you also have the fact that several other steamboats were sent north from Vicksburg, basically empty, because the passengers had been promised to the captain of the Sultana, directly showing that this was completely avoidable. So the Sultana, completely overloaded, somewhat reinforced to be able to even hold the passengers at all, starts heading upriver. On April 26th, a famous last photo was taken of the Sultana at Helena, Arkansas. It is said that when the soldiers on board shifted to one side to be in the photograph of the Sultana, it nearly capsized due to just the shifting of their weight to one side of the boat. At 2 a.m. on April 27th, one of the boilers exploded, killing hundreds of people instantly, no doubt maiming many others, and then helping cause the already overburdened boat to start collapsing upon itself and catching fire. Many of the men had to jump into the river basically immediately to try to survive, but the Mississippi River is miles wide at this point. And many of these men were recently released from horrid conditions in the Andersonville prison, so they're weakened and people weren't you know, necessarily capable of swimming very well in that time period to begin with, let alone swimming miles. To make things worse, it took about an hour for the first rescuers to arrive on scene and start pulling men out of the water. And US gunboats didn't come upstream for an hour and a half afterwards, despite the fact that the explosion and the fire could be seen from miles away. Because of poor record keeping and you know the complications of men dying after being taken out of the water and whatnot, we don't know exactly how many people died in the Sultana disaster. The Battlefield Trust estimates around 1,195 died, but there are some estimates that say over 1,700 people died in this one disaster. So depending on which estimate you go by, that makes the sinking of the Sultana a worse disaster than even the sinking of the Titanic, which lost around 1,500 people. So if 1,700 people died and the Sultana went down, 
200 people more died in this tiny steamboat explosion than in the sinking of the largest ship of the period. Despite the affair and you know the obvious bad press this incident got, Captain Williams and Captain Speed largely avoided taking responsibility. Speed was court-martialed, but then ultimately got you know exonerated. Basically, the blame was laid on the steamboat's captain for not properly repairing the boiler, and the captain conveniently died when the ship went down, so there was nobody living left to blame. And the U.S. Army did not want to blame a regular U.S. Army officer for the disaster. So Williams basically gets to finish out his career. He gets promoted. He becomes a major in the regular army after the Civil War, is stationed in the West, and then he retires in 1870 and dies in 1889. His death in 1889 was reported to be largely due to the effects of injuries suffered at Vicksburg during the Civil War. In the years that followed William's death, his Colt Model 1861 Navy revolvers presented to him in 1864 became even more famous than Williams himself. As I mentioned earlier on, this pair has been published in at least eight publications. One of these publications was Dexter's Antique Weapon Trade Journal presenting the McMurdo Silver Colt Collection. In it, F. Theodore Dexter called this pair America's most beautiful presentation Colts, probably the most beautiful early Colt outfit ever got up, and whoever finally owns this never need fear that a better one will turn up. The outfit is like new and extra fine. This beautiful and historic pair of Colt 1861 Navy revolvers are just one of several sets and individual Colt revolvers in our upcoming April Premier Firearms auction. You know, we've got some of the best of the best. These are certainly among the best of the best out there in existence for 1861 navies. We've also got some absolutely incredible revolvers from other collections, including the Greg Lamp collection, where we've got, you know, basically new Colt 1860 armies with fluted cylinders and other incredible Colts. So definitely check out the complete catalog for all the details and some amazing photos of some stunning Colt revolvers.